The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hey there, good evening. Welcome to the Bronx Buzz. Uh, as you probably know, we've been talking about it every week for six years. This is Bronx Nets program where we talk to reporters and writers and editors, and journalists, uh, anybody putting stuff out in uh, print. We also, on occasion, do uh, photographers and filmmakers and videographers and people who do uh, the visual arts. Um, but this evening, we're going to have two different journalists uh, talking to us, and uh, we're going to get started um, with our longtime friend Eileen Markey, uh, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Journalism and Media Studies at Lehman, but an author. Uh, here's proof. <laughs> uh, Radical Faith uh, is uh, one of her books. Uh, nice to see you, Eileen. Lovely to be with you, Gary. Uh, you wrote an op-ed piece um, in the Daily News that caught my eye, um, Where Bronx Housing Went Awry. And uh, you took a look at Twin Parks. That was the building that had that terrible tragedy uh, and that tragic fire that could very well have been uh, presented. So I guess I'm just going to ask you um, in general the title of the piece, where did Bronx housing go awry that unfortunately led us to this and other um, difficult uh, issues? Yeah, well, you know, when we stopped thinking about housing as a place where people live, as a place where families are created and, and uh, people have their home as a building block of society, and really in a very accelerated fashion in the last 10 years, um, have moved to understand housing as profit. Obviously, we've always had private property in it, and it works well in many cases. Um, but what we saw, or what I saw thinking about the Twin Parks fire is there was so much attention rightly paid to that horrible tragedy and really, you know, news coverage of it all over the world. I was getting, as I think anybody who lives in the Bronx was getting, you know, texts and emails and, and Facebook messages and what, whatnot from friends all around the world, right? Being like, oh my God, I saw that fire. How are you? I, I had actually, I have to interject. I had actually people ask me if I was okay. Yeah. And, and I, <laughs> I mean, I don't live anywhere near there. Certainly we have extreme care for anybody who is affected. But I, I was like, wow, it, it became worldwide news. And of course that that, uh, you know, um, emblemizes the Bronx in certain ways. It does, it, right? It reminded, oh, yeah, it reminded people, right, uh, of, of you know, really bad old days. And it just became this headline um, all around the world, such, which was, I mean, because it was a terrible, horrible tragedy and it caught people's imagination and it was an outrage. Um, and then, you know, there was really excellent coverage of it. I teach journalism, so I was obviously paying attention. To and and you, th you I, I, that, that's really interesting to me in and of itself. You thought the coverage was good. And, there was and so better much than... coverage. And then that's eventually right. within a couple of days, it became much deeper, right? Like so mm -hmm. pretty quickly, news organizations that don't usually do anything near investigative reporting were digging in and reading the HPD reports. We're going into Akers and we're reading of mortgages, right? We're and it was to... like, it was like, how can this possibly happen, especially when it was so eminently preventable? I mean, let's face it, just close a couple of doors, not to say you wouldn't have had a fire or a problem, but you certainly wouldn't have had the, the kind of destruction and devastation. In exactly. And so because there was so much attention to this one fire, I, I wanted to look a little bit more deeply at it and to, to think a little bit more critically about it. Um, and of course, anybody who pays attention to housing in the Bronx, uh, pays attention to rental issues, knows there are there are hundreds of buildings in the Bronx that are in really terrible condition that have far worse, actually, housing violation records than Twin Parks did, right? Like hundreds of, um, of code violations just year after year. I mean, I'm, I'm taking a deep breath because don't we know it? I mean, I've been sitting right? in this seat for 27 years, I'm telling you. Yeah, I've I mean, I wrote a big Way back then. For The Voice in almost a year ago now, looking at all of um, the horrible conditions in this, you know, one of the worst landlords, Park Hash's buildings. He's only one right. name, right? The, every year the uh, the public advocate puts out a list of the worst landlords in the city and they own so, dozens of dozens of buildings and people are living in terrible conditions. Twin Parks was actually not an outlier in that regard. But, but, but the, the, 
you you I'm, I'm going to pull the quote out of your writing and it said the, the building exists really as a means of transferring public money to private individuals uh what i was not aware of um uh, maybe i was vaguely aware that um this was a michelama project which um frankly um has you know been a one of the best housing concepts you could ever have and yet it's no longer in Mitchell Let's talk about that transition in relation to the concept that all sure. of a sudden it's not for the public, but it's for the private enterprises. Sure. I mean, you know, New York City is a company town. Real estate is the is the business in New York, right? If you think about, you know, steel mills in, in Pittsburgh several generations ago here, what we have is real estate. And for that reason, real estate has a tremendous influence on it on public policy, on how our governance works. Um, we also have, you know, housing that is very, very expensive. And we have a lot of, we have rich people in New York, we have a lot of middle-class people, and we have a lot of poor people. And you need to find ways for everybody to, to live in a decent, in a decent affordable housing. Um, and so the state has all these complicated interventions into the private market to try to preserve some level of housing that regular people can afford to live in. And right. uh, Mitchell Lama was one of those developed uh, in the years after World War II when there's a uh, housing shortage, right, with all these returning GIs, a really useful public-private partnership kind of program. Um, and many of these, it's based on tax subsidies. Um, many of those buildings started to exit regulation um, about 15, 20 years ago. And, and I'll interject to just to move it along, because people feel like I, if, if it was private, I could sell my apartment, I could make some money. The downside is that you are then taking this public private partnership concept yeah. and moving it into somebody who may not really give a hoot about right. how so well I, you're doing. <laughs> what I wrote about in the Daily News was really just trying to get people to pay attention to the fact that Twin Parks is not unique, right? Twin Parks, um, unfortunately, there's a lot of buildings that are in bad shape in terms of their maintenance. And even bigger than that issue is this issue that there's been so much investment in Bronx real estate that a lot of that that sentence you quoted that it exists as a means of transferring wealth to private individuals right as the state and city are trying to figure out ways to keep some buildings affordable keep the rents at a at a level that normal people could afford we do that by really cajoling and begging private landlords into into keeping rents at a certain level and we do that by giving them all kinds of tax breaks and subsidies and loan guarantees and and uh, management fees to run the affordable building um and if you're the landlord in that case, I mean, it's a great deal, right? Like you, right. you have and, to and, rent and if you at do a certain level, it's true, and they're regulated and you can't just willy-nilly mm -hmm. raise them. Um, and, but in many cases, people are using programs to pay for that. So the money is very much guaranteed, right? Like by the government. So and if they don't care, fees, yeah. so if they don't care, then this is what you're alleging and what you're suggesting is this is the outcome of it. Right. I mean, right. the, the outcome is money, to let it go. The money, the way to make money running a building that has regulated rents is to put as little as you can into maintenance. That is the way to make money, right? There's so many nonprofit affordable housing management companies and developers in the Bronx, right? Like, you know, this is how the Bronx was rebuilt, right? right? It was nonprofit housing organizations. Those organizations, when you look at their books, they tend to put 75% of their rent roll back into the building into maintenance right, right? so you take out 100 bucks you, you get that in rent roll right and me and you and all of our neighbors paying our rent 75 dollars of that 100 goes back into paying for the boiler and fixing the paint and repairing the self-closing doors and fixing the and, and you're not that money does not go into somebody's pockets or percentages of that uh, who are doing it to to make a profit so in privately owned buildings especially these buildings that are owned by big investment firms like what twin parks was it's 30 percent of the rent roll goes back oh. into maintenance that's wow. where you make the money between and, 75 and, then, and 30 right and then the cost is the condition of the building and, the cost and everything is the else condition of the building. you did something that i had never thought about but it made a ton of sense in the uh, framework that you've painted for us just now you compared what happened there to the burning of the bronx uh, in the 70s i thought that was fascinating because of course they burnt it uh, for the insurance money uh, because it was it was just like you know moving property to them and said well let's just get rid of it we can do better without it and it didn't matter what happened to the people 
um, uh, largely immigrants and people of color, by the way, who lived in those buildings. Right. I mean, that's I thought it was a brilliant Eileen. I thought it was brilliant. I mean, you know, you see the poster behind me from that decade of fire movie. Oh, there you it is. Yes. You can't think about real estate and fire in the Bronx and not think about the 70s. I know the borough has moved on. There's all sorts of wonderful and important and good things that have happened since then. And they're they're very much worth talking about and thinking about. Um, but one of the reasons that the Twin Park story hit people so viscerally and, and certainly the reason it was covered on media all around the world is that it tagged back to that memory. Um, you know, David Gonzalez wrote that absolutely amazing essay in the Times about yes. a week later. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, of course. Like there's a fire here and it, it makes people think about that. That's why it got covered. And the difference now, I mean, it's, it's very different, right? Like this fire was not intentionally set. There's no allegation that that's what happened. It was, it was a bad accident and an ax, but it was an accident that happened because um, of some structural issues, right? Because of the door not closing, because of people using you know, they didn't feel warm enough, right? Yeah, you know, I I would also mention yes, the 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 notion that they had to use a um a, you know a home heater is one thing, but you could go through many buildings in the Bronx and clo and and let the door close at a stairwell, and you know the simple springs right. that make the door close, right? You know, uh, uh, don't exist. I have to tell you that next week on Bronx Talk. Yeah. Uh, we will be um, uh, do, talking about CLTs, community land trusts, and right. what you are suggesting right. in, in, implicitly yeah. it, as a solution is to keep the public ownership in the nature of housing. Uh, that I'm assuming that would be a concept you would think would fit here as a preventative measure, in addition to uh, you know uh, investing in Mitchell Lama or whatever. Right. Yeah. It's not. It's not a simple. It's not a. It's not a simple problem to solve, right? The problem of the fact that real estate is too valuable for people to live in. That's what it is, right? So when we're thinking back to the 70s, the, the problem is that um, that fires got out of control and that people were willing to engage in arson because the, the buildings had no financial value other than as an insurance payout. Of course, they had tremendous value of places where people lived and families right. were trying to continue. But financially they had so little value that all they were worth was their insurance payout. Now they have so much value um, that it's very difficult to keep them at prices that normal people can afford to live in them. And they have so much value that they're actually more valuable as things to borrow against than as properties to own. I think a lot of us think of apartment buildings as, um, yeah, of course, just a place where most of us live, but then, so somebody owns it and they take care of it and they try and, and to do as good as they can, and maybe they do or they don't keep up on the maintenance. Right. But that's not exactly an accurate way to understand them anymore. The, the, it's really more like they're stocks. Or we're, we're gonna we're gonna have to run. Um, but the illusion, or or silly us, we mm -hmm. think that they're in it because if our you know plumbing breaks, that they're going to go replace the plumbing. But boy, does that eat into profits. And then they want another government handout to pay for the repairs. And you're never getting out of that. So Eileen, um, one of the great values uh, that we have in the Bronx is that we have journalists and reporters and op-ed writers like you uh, to help alert us to this. And I found that that piece you wrote in the Daily News was fascinating, was illuminating. And um, uh, we, we just can't thank you enough for joining us and helping us fully understand another step of how we're going to get closer yeah. to solving some of these things. Yeah. Nice. Thanks um, so much, Gary. It's always a, a pleasure to be with you. We appreciate it. Listen, we're going to take a short break. And then another young uh, a journalist that I know, um, Eileen, and others uh, beginning to respect more and more, Robbie Sequara from the uh, Bronx Times will join us. And uh, we'll talk with uh, some of the other Bronx issues with him. Don't go away. Who is most at risk for coronavirus? People over 65, people with underlying medical conditions like heart disease, chronic lung disease, asthma, diabetes, people undergoing cancer treatment, and people with weakened immune systems. What should you do if you or a loved one is at higher risk? Avoid close contact with people, avoid crowds, stay home if you can, wash your hands frequently, learn more ways to protect yourself and others at coronavirus.gov.
Okay, back with you on the Bronx Buzz. Thanks to uh, Eileen for joining us. Um, but we're going to switch gears. Um, uh, Robbie Sequera um, uh, had a, an emergency and uh, could not join us at the last minute. But I am just thrilled because uh, my buddy Juan Rosa, who is the National Director of Civic Engagement at the Naleo Educational Fund, is with us. And we've got some important stuff to talk with uh, Juan about. Nice to have you with us. Thank you so much, Gary. Pleasure to be here with you. Uh, for people who don't know who and what Naleo is, is 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 the National Association for Latino Elected and Appointed Officials. Um, but let's um, talk a little bit about um, what what your real advocacy is right now. And I told you I'm squarely behind it, uh, and that is the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act of New York State. What is it, and why for Naleo is this just that important? Great, uh, Gary, uh, as you know, uh, since 2013, when the Supreme Court uh, uh, gave its decision on the Shelby County versus Holder uh, decision, uh, it gutted certain provisions of the Voting Rights Act in the United States. Um, since then, uh, we've seen state after state, jurisdiction after jurisdiction at the national level, uh, roll back uh, some protections uh, for voters, especially uh, uh, voters of color, uh, voters whose uh, primary language is not English, and uh, we felt that uh, we needed to be squarely behind the decision here in New York State by State Senator Zelno Marie from Brooklyn and Assemblywoman Latrice Walker, also from Brooklyn, of introducing a state bill uh, that would allow uh, New York City, New York State voters from being protected uh, by law. Uh, at the ballot. And we could talk a little bit more about sure. specific detail. Um, what, what's interesting, of course, John Lewis, um, one of the great um, uh, Congress members of, of all time, one of, one of the most important figures in racial justice in, in the United States of America. Is there a difference um, between the national John Lewis Voting Rights Act and the one that New York State is putting in place? Or did New York State simply say, we like that, we're going to use it for our stuff? <laughs> So the voting, the there is a difference. There are several differences. Uh, one of the differences is that at least in the New York State case, it expands language uh, assistant protections. Uh, so right now, uh, under uh, current legislation, uh, only certain counties in New York State are protected. Uh, 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 are I'm sorry, are obligated to provide certain levels of language assistance. Right. Oh. Of course, they're complemented by by other local laws. Uh, but uh, quite frankly, on the books, uh, only certain counties. As you know, uh, the, uh, there's a need for language access all throughout the state. Uh, if you look at the counties that make up Long Island, if you look at uh, places around big city centers like uh, Rochester. Or Syracuse, New York City. <laughs> and our home borough of the Bronx. <laughs> Start there, but that's okay. It's not there. So one of the... One of the, the, one of the uh, really good parts about this bill is that it would expand language assistance throughout the state. Uh, I, 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 gotta, I gotta ask you this, let's just start with that. It's so fundamental and it's so silly to think that New York state will have it. Down in Texas on the border, there are many Hispanic people. In Florida, there are obviously Cubans and people from, I mean, and then that's only talking Spanish. You talk about the entire Mexican border with Arizona and New Mexico. I mean, these are Americans. And if they don't speak the language, well, they should be able to vote. I mean, I, you know, I, it, it, the whole thing just blows my mind. So let, let's start there. Um, so even though we're doing it in New York, I'm still not excusing the other 49 states for not endorsing it. But OK, so that's number one. We got to have it. And and listen, uh, let's talk about, you know, our diverse borough of the Bronx with Korean and, and Russian and, and um, mm -hmm. uh, Chinese uh, and all. I, I mean, I'm going to leave somebody out uh, because there are too many. Of course, we need expanded language, uh, you know, accessibility for everybody. So that's num numero uno. That's the first thing. What else you got? <laughs> Numero dos, number two. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> number two, it flips plea clearance on, on its head, right? So at the at the national level, a plea pre clearance is a, a system by which local jurisdictions, especially counties, uh, would have to demonstrate uh, to the Justice Department that laws that are put in place, regulations that are put in place uh, from time to time 
don't roll back the rights implemented through the Voting Rights Act. Uh, in New York, again, uh, they it, instead of citizens and advocates having to sue the jurisdiction or the city uh, to uh, uh, to ensure that um, they're not being discriminated against, uh, the New York State uh, Voting Rights Act actually makes it so that jurisdictions have to prove that their uh, any changes to their laws uh, or to their uh, election administration practices are not hurting. Uh, uh, the oh. voting rights of, of, of voters of all colors, of so, all backgrounds. Again, a fundamental thing. You got to be fair. And if it's not fair, don't make us have to sue you because that becomes a nightmare for all things. You got to pay for a lawyer. You got to do everything else. So that, that's number two. Um, and um, what else? The, there's a third one in there. I think it was the idea of legal tools um, uh, to uh, fight back against voter suppression, right? That's what we're talking right. about. It yeah. makes it makes it tr it lowers the, uh, some of the thresholds that you have to uh, prove in order mm -hmm. to prove discrimination, right? So it gives uh, advocates, it gives uh, ordinary citizens more tools uh, to interpret the law uh, to uh, to demonstrate uh, to demonstrate um, uh, discrimination, right? Or to demonstrate uh, voter dilution uh, or voter uh, suppression, right? Um, whereas um, the 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 hurdle again to the threshold, I guess, to prove discrimination currently is quite high. Um, it, it it will lower uh, uh, the threshold and allow for again more uh, uh, easier um, uh, the, uh, interpretations. Right? Yeah, e easier access and the threshold is higher mm -hmm. so that um, uh, currently it's higher. You want to lower it so that um, if you've been discriminated against, again, it's, you, you know, they send you through the court system. You don't have to do that. What, what I want, really want to know now, so here it is. It's, it sounds logical to me. It sounds like something we need to do. We want all American citizens to have access and to be able to vote. What is holding, is anything holding it up or you're just advocating it now to make sure it passes through the legislature during this session? Well, uh, uh, the legislation was first introduced in 2020 uh, by mm -hmm. uh, Selnor Marie again, and uh, it gained a lot of traction in the state Senate, but not in the state assembly uh, here in New York. Well, now that's ironic because <laughs> um, a lot of these, um, I mean, it's almost flipped from the way it, you would think, even though we do have a Democratic majority in the Senate. What or who is holding it up in the assembly? Yeah. So for uh, for us, uh, the work that we've done is to educate the elected officials. And certainly we've had very good elected officials in the Bronx that have been behind this uh, from uh, from day one. Uh, right. We have uh, the newer members to the assembly, like Assemblywoman Yudel Katapia, Assemblymember Kenny Burgos, uh, who have certainly been behind this. Uh, uh, Yudelka, uh, Assemblywoman Tapia, right from the beginning of her tenure. I, I can't imagine Amanda Septimo is not behind it. And Amanda Septimo, uh, obviously Jeff Dinowitz. So we have some of the the the, the you know the Bronx All Stars. That's uh, who we are. <laughs> have joined, have joined, and been supported. But we've had to do. Um, some education, right? I don't think I, I I don't believe that it's been opposition, but rather the lack of prioritization, right? Oh. So we've had to go out and say, look, you know, we don't really see Congress moving anytime soon uh, to remediate oh. the process. Uh, to remediate yeah, I understand that. So right? in other words, they have many things. Listen, um, uh, the health act is out there. Uh, obviously, they're going to deal with the budget for the next few, you know, a week or two to get that done. But you want to say, let's put this on the table and make sure it passes. Right. And and to be quite honest, there's been since uh, 2020, there's been a lot of progress in the way the New York State uh, administers elections. For example, uh, the the expansion of, of our absentee voting rules um, has been a welcome uh, change. Uh, we needed to do it for the pandemic, but it, it's sticking around. Um, so that's a positive development. The introduction of early voting, uh, the way that people have nine days uh, before election day uh, to vote, that's a, that's a big change. Um, and uh, it allows more people uh, with a schedules, work and life schedules that are not as flexible uh, to participate in democracy. So we've seen a lot of change in New York State. 
Um, so we're not beating anyone over their head, right? Uh, there's right. been a lot of positive change. Right. Uh, do you but, want to keep the momentum going and have this be another, another you know, brick right. in the wall, so to speak? Right. And, and you know that, uh, you know, a lot of uh, President Biden, when he was a uh, candidate Biden, uh, really championed voting rights as one of the things that he yep. would work on on day one. And uh, as we've seen, um, other things have have taken priority. Um, now with uh, the the uh, the status of our, our foreign affairs, with uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, and what it means, I, we just don't see uh, voting rights moving forward in at right. the federal level, it, it, and it adds urgency to us doing it here in New York State. And, 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 and these days, he's also got the Supreme Court nomination that they're pushing. And, you know, what you say is really a revelation for a lot of people. Say, well, it's totally logical. Let's just get it passed. But with all the other things going on, these kinds of things tend to move down the priority scale. And now it's a, what, what Naleo and what you were saying is now we got it, it's just as important as anything else. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the other the other important piece of this, Gary, is that uh, New York can set the example. New York can uh -huh. lead the way. Uh, I love and, that. <laughs> <laughs> some, some of these things would be a, a pioneering. Right. Some of this uh, are rules around preclearance, for example. It would really set a standard uh, for other states around the nation to adopt. Uh, so uh, it, it's not only that it's timely, again, because uh, we just don't see Congress taking action. Uh, but it's also a fact that New York has an opportunity to set the standard for other states in how we should be looking at voting rights protection, voting rights protection at the state level. Um, Juan, um, what what would the timing be like? Let's just hypothesize that they're going to pass this, um, you know, sometime this spring. Could it be in place in time for the June primaries, or is really the goal is to just get it done and then it'll go all the way around till uh, November? Got about a minute left, so uh, get, let's get to it. <laughs> we at the Naleo Educational Fund would like uh, this measure to pass as soon as possible. Uh, obviously, the state has to pass a budget by April 1st. This bill does have budgetary implications because it requires oh. money for the state uh, for the state attorney general's office to open up a new office to look up preclearance, to include a depository of information. Uh, so it does have budget Terry got, implications. Got to do it now. Just do, it now. do it now. Put it, put it in the budget. So that's the point. Um, uh, I guess uh, I'm going to say for you, you uh, write to your uh, assembly member, write to your senator, write to the governor, make a phone call and say we support the uh, John R. Lewis uh, uh, Voting Rights Act in New York State. Right. That's that's the message. That simple, Gary. It's that and, simple. And if you have questions, uh, you just get to Naleo. And, and you guys will support all the efforts. Absolutely. Great. Juan R. Rosa, National Director of Civic Engagement at the Naleo Educational Fund. And that's all for uh, Bronx, uh, the Bronx Buzz for uh, tonight. Uh, we thank Eileen uh, for joining us. We thank Juan for joining us. Uh, we hope Robbie uh, will join us uh, sometime soon. And we'll see you next week. Good night.